Hey everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to round six coverage of my games from the uh, 2018 Larry Evans Memorial Chess Tournament. Um, so in round six, coming into round six, I was still half a point behind 50%. So this game was a key game in terms of my uh, results for the tournament. If I were to win this game, I'd get up to 50%. And seeing as I faced, uh, well, five of the six players I faced were higher rated, that means that I would gain some rating points. Uh, if I get a draw in this uh, round six game, then I probably break even on ratings. And then if I uh, lose the round six game, then I will probably uh, lose rating points. So uh, this all hangs in the balance. Um, I have the white pieces. My opponent has a rating of 1865, and I have a rating of 1803 for this tournament. So I start off with uh, c4, the English opening. Uh, my opponent goes e6, I go g3, and he goes d5. So this um, e6, d5 setup is a pretty interesting one. It prevents me from uh, getting to my uh, Botvinnik system because, um, you know, the pawns are already set up there to trade off those, those Botvinnik pawns when they come forward. Um, so I should just continue with normal development here. Um, moves like uh, bishop to g2 and knight to f3. Well, let's give a normal line here. Say knight f3. Those moves can be played in any order, but this is the, the one, one way of playing it. And uh, this is a typical kind of position that might result castles, castles. And at anywhere, anywhere in any of those uh, three moves that I just went through, instead of, uh, you know, moving the knight or the bishop or castle, I could have played d4 at any time and transpose into a cat line. So that's always an option. And even here, uh, d4 is, is still uh, the main move. But to stay in English territory, uh, you could play uh, b3. And so that's a way to keep this in English territory. And, uh, you know, this bishop has an interesting square here and diagonal. Um, if at any time uh, black ever takes this pawn, well, up until the point where, uh, if we back up, up until the point where black is castled, if at any time he takes this pawn, then, then queen a4 check will round it up. So that pawn is never in any danger. Uh, and then after he castles, he should probably do something about it. But as I said, uh, d4 is actually the main move here. It's uh, going for an open Catalan if he takes the pawn, um, or b3 defending it and staying in English territory. So that's uh, probably how I will play uh, next time. But uh, at this point, I, I just could not remember uh, anything about this position. I wasn't sure how to play. And I decided to just play it simple and trade off this uh, c pawn. And I was thinking uh, this might not be too bad because it does uh, have the idea of uh, giving up your, your c pawn for one of the center pawns. So, so white has two pawns in the center and black only has one. But uh, in fact, that, uh, this position is quite uh, favorable for uh, black, or at least equal. So I think uh, that was just a mistake. It lets, um, let's black get this strong pawn in the center that I can't easily uh, undermine. And uh, yeah, I think it just leads to easy equality for black. So I, I would not play this way again. Next time I will go and just uh, do normal development. But anyway, this is the position uh, we got into. Let's say I continue with bishop g2. He goes knight f6. I go d3. So I'm just going for kind of a reverse uh, dragon setup. Uh, he goes bishop e7. I go knight to uh, c3. He castles. And I go knight f3. Now knight f3 maybe is a little bit of a mistake. Um, the chess engine is recommending something like uh, e3 here. And uh, well, the problem is that I haven't done anything about this potential pawn push. Um, and uh, when I play knight f3, it's blocking the bishop. Right now, if he pushes his pawn forward, I could play knight to uh, e4 defended by the bishop. So if he trades, it doesn't, doesn't cause any harm. But um, after knight f3, white really could, cons I mean black, black really could consider pushing that pawn to d4. Um, he didn't actually play this, but uh, this would have been interesting for black, um, you know, and maybe just take that knight off and, and give me these doubled pawns here. Uh, anyway, uh, interesting position. He didn't play that way. He played uh, simply with uh, just uh, c6, just shoring up the center, and it is a fine way for black to play as well. It's just that d4 was an interesting opportunity there. 
and I played bishop g5. So this is another questionable move. But uh, what I was thinking was I had, I had noticed this problem with the knight by now, and I was thinking uh, I would like to just trade off his knight so that if uh, d4 ever happens, I can go knight e4. And, uh, you know, if his bishop is there, I'll be hitting the bishop. But at any way, in any case, I won't, it won't get traded off. So I went for this idea. He kicked the bishop, and I went ahead and traded. But this does leave black with the permanent uh, advantage of the uh, bishop pair, or at least uh, he has that advantage for a while. And um, so I think there's a slight edge to black in this position, like the chess engine likes black. Um, so I, I've kind of messed up the opening, I guess, is the, the summary here. First with, uh, first with uh, that early exchange, taking c takes d5, and then secondly with this uh, other exchange of bishop takes knight. So I had my reasons for playing that way, but they were not, uh, they were just not the best moves here. So black continued with bishop f5. Um, there's a lot of ways for black to continue here. The chess engine likes uh, uh, these moves. Well, rook e8, that's, that's a good move, just putting the rook on an open diagonal, open, open file. Uh, queen to b6 looks like a good move here. And also knight to a6. Um, since this uh, c6 uh, square is blocked by a pawn, knight to a6 has a couple ideas. Maybe it can hop into uh, b4 if my queen goes to c2 to kind of harass the queen, or maybe it could come back here to c2 and come around onto the queen side. So anyway, those are the uh, top three suggestions from the chess engine. My opponent played bishop f5, which also is uh, good for black, but I could have... Uh, maybe mix things up a little bit here with an immediate uh, e4, uh, kicking back on the bishop. I thought about this a little bit. I just wasn't sure how it would uh, turn out. So after this, um, also it might lead to this uh, queen trade, which I wasn't didn't didn't really want to get an early queen trade. Um, but maybe I can get some activity like this. Um, so pushing that pawn forward, hitting this bishop, provoking an exchange. And then, uh, then black grabs a pawn, rook to e1. So this is a chess engine suggestion. So what, if we look at this, um, well, I've got a tempo on the bishop. He hasn't developed his knight, but I have sacrificed a pawn. So um, I guess the chess engine is saying it's, it's a, good, a good time here to sacrifice a pawn and try and get some activity, because otherwise um, black is just better. So that's that e4 move. But it seems that white has compensation in that line. Um, anyway, I, I didn't wasn't wasn't up for that, and I just played queen b3, which was a, 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 a not a bad choice. This is also one of the engine suggestions, queen b3 here. Um, often it's an idea when this knight has developed. I mean, when this bishop has developed out to uh, out to the king side, it leaves the uh, b pawn undefended. You can put the question to the b pawn right away, um, and he played queen b6, which was also a good move. And I decided eventually I wanted to just keep the queens on and drop my queen back to c2. Um, Chess Engine likes e4 here once again, and just allowing the queen trade. But uh, well, I, I wasn't ready for the queen trade just yet. I wanted to keep the queens on and, and try and keep the game uh, long and interesting. Let's see, he went knight d7, developing his knight. Go rick a to c1. At this point, I was, uh, well, I was getting my uh, rick off of this uh, diagonal so that I could start pushing these pawns forward on the queen side. I was starting to have some ideas of uh, something like a minority attack against these pawns, or at least uh, just trying to create some play against the pawns with the, with the bishop here and, uh, you know, pressure on the C file. If I could get those pawns going, maybe something good could happen. So he goes rook f8. That's a good move. Counter, counter pressure on my e pawn. Uh, let's see, I want rook fe1, just defending it, because I am planning to uh, move these pieces away. I didn't want them tied down to the defense of e7, and maybe it's I mean, e2, and maybe at some point I will play e5. Um, and now he went g5. That's a very interesting move, <clears throat> and it's not bad. I thought maybe I could exploit it somehow during the game, but I never really uh, found a way to do that. And it does take away that square from the knight, the h4 square, which I might have played to harass his bishop at some point. So it does weaken the king side. There is one point where actually this, this weakness uh, might have been uh, a factor, so I'll, I'll get to that later. So um, now g5 was not necessary. The chess engine would continue with just uh, rook a to d8. 
let's say here, here I could play e4, I think, and get away with it. Pawn takes, knight takes, because I have enough force on there to hold on to it. And then uh, bishop back to e7 e is the uh, the line. I think black is still good here. I mean, I have this uh, weak weak pawn on d6, that, uh, this isolated pawn on d6 that, uh, that black can target. And... Um, and black has active pieces, so I think black is still standing well here. But um, anyway, that's that's the uh, chess engine's recommendation. And after g5, um, there is later a chance for me to equalize uh, exploiting this. But I think for now, uh, um, black still has an edge. Let's see, I go knight a4 to kick the queen and defend this pawn. I'm trying to kind of unwind from my situation over on the queen side so I can get these pawns moving. Um, he played the queen to... Um, a4 here. So keeping it out on the queen side, so making it a little more difficult for me to uh, do what I want to. You know, one of my ideas was to hop a knight in here, but that is covered at the moment. Um, is it covered? Yeah, it's, it's uh, well, no, he can't take it, but he could take the A pawn. So anyway, I played uh, A3 here. He went uh, rook A to C8, and then I played uh, B4 to kick kick the queen back. And so the queen went all the way back to d8. And now I hopped my knight into um, c5. So that, that was the point of my play. I, I managed to get my pawns rolling over here on the queen side. And um, I'm just going to try and create some weaknesses over here. So he traded right away. He took he took back with the pawn. Um, I could also have taken with the queen. There, there was uh, points to both. But I decided to take with the pawn and, and just try and pile up on the b-pawn again. Let's see, he brought his queen back to a5. Taking a look at my uh, loose pawn here on a6, as well as looking at the c-pawn. And I played queen to b3. So that defends my pawn and um, and attacks his, his uh, b-pawn. I thought he might just uh, defend the b-pawn, but, um, oh, let's see, I'm sorry, I went, didn't go to b3, I went, I went to b2. Same idea though. Yeah, b3, the, the uh, b2, the bishop would take it. So that was that was not really an available square. Yeah, I went queen b3 there. Uh, I thought he might just defend that, but um, he played actively to dissolve his weakness with, uh, or potential weakness. I don't even know if that was all that weak, but uh, he gets rid of that problem by just pushing the pawn forward. So I played queen b4 here, which I think is a bit of a mistake. Let's see. Um, Taking. I did not like taking. I thought he would just take back with a pawn. The chess engine indicates this is playable, but uh, he's got this uh, this pretty solid-looking group of pawns on the queen side now, and uh, you know he he maybe can get these rolling as a steamroller. And I'm left with this uh, weak pawn on the outside, so I wasn't wasn't too happy about that idea. So I didn't want to take. Uh, another idea here is just to play d4, holding on to the c pawn. And also, uh, another idea here is to uh, shut out this bishop so that the rook could come over to uh, a1 and defend the uh, the a pawn. I guess if he takes, I can take back with the rook kicking the queen, and I can just try and maintain that pawn on d. And maintain that pawn on uh, d4. Uh, so the, those are ways to play it. I played queen b4, and uh, there's a little bit of a misjudgment because I was thinking if he takes that I, I should be okay. That's what I was thinking. I would, I would get a pawn here that um, would be holding back his pawns and I was expecting this pawn to become weak. But actually uh, it's not so easy for me to target that pawn and he gets, he gets a rolling very quickly. I have to play um, d4 here now to shut out the bishop. He can push it again. And now, you know, I can get a rook to um, a1 here to block it, but he's uh, he's got that pawn pretty far forward. He can defend it with his rooks uh, without too much difficulty. And, um, you know, the chess engine just thinks this is a, a winning position for black, uh, or, or very good for black anyway. So, so it's interesting. So that was a misjudgment on my part, allowing that uh, queen trade, um, thinking that uh, I would be okay after that. I guess the, the thing is, uh, you know, I can leave him with this uh, lonely A pawn, but with the queens off, we're heading more towards an end game where that becomes more of an asset than a liability. That isolated A pawn, maybe it's a weakness in the middle game when you have lots of uh, pieces to attack it with, 
but uh, as you get towards the end game it, and it's a uh, passed pawn, it becomes much more of a threat. So, um, so black really should have gone for that trade. Um, I guess maybe we both made the same mistake in assessing that position because he just uh, dropped his uh, queen back to a6. So I played uh, knight d4 here. I was hoping to uh, gain a tempo on this uh, loose bishop and uh, maybe start putting some pressure on this uh, c pawn. There's a threat here to take and uh, grab that pawn with the knight and the rook coordinated against it. So he took immediately on c5. I took back with the queen, keeping the pressure on that pawn and also keeping this pawn defended. But he has uh, bishop e7 here, kicking my queen and uh, dropping it back. But he doesn't, um, he doesn't lose, uh, I mean, I don't lose that pawn because uh, he's got to deal with his bishop. The bishop was hanging all that time, but he was playing, uh, he was playing very actively. After knight d4, bishop, or pawn takes, hits the queen, so I have to respond to it. And then bishop e7 also hits the queen. Uh, so I have to respond to that. And then finally he drops his bishop back. So uh, good play from black there. I have to mention at this point, though, that uh, black was taking lots of time to uh, to think about these moves and to find the best moves. So uh, so he's building up an advantage on the board, but he's uh, really falling behind on the clock. Anyway, I have just enough time after his bishop retreats to play a4 and uh, hold on to my pawn. So the material is even for now. Um, let's see. He continues to play slowly. Didn't didn't start speeding up here. He continues to play slowly and uh, played rook e to d8. Let's see, I dropped my knight back to f3. Um, yeah, I wanted to push the uh, d pawn forward and try and uh, blockade these pawns. Let's see. He went uh, bishop to e6 to defend his uh, his uh, d pawn in advance, and I played d4. So. I'm trying to establish a blockade on these pawns and turn this into a backwards pawn that I can target with a move like knight to uh, knight to uh, e5 there. But uh, black immediately um, dissolves his weakness once again. This is also a good move here. Uh, I really have nothing better to do than to take it. And then I played uh, queen b2, which uh, gives up this pawn. I actually thought when I gave up that pawn that uh, that I was going to get it back right away. I was I was overlooking something. Well, I'd kind of calculated this uh, in advance. Yeah, <laughs> what I was overlooking was that uh, I, I did the calculation from this point. I saw that you know he could push and I could take and he could take with the with the rook and I would move the queen out of the way. Uh, what I was thinking was that when I hit the queen. The queen isn't going to have any move to come back. I mean, when I hit the queen with the rook, which is my plan to recapture the a pawn, the queen has no way, no square to go to to defend that pawn. But after after you play through the sequence, c5, pawn takes, rook takes, queen b2, and he takes. And now I play rook a1. His queen does have a square to go to that defends the pawn because the exchange, well, the push on the has cleared, the push of the c pawn has cleared that. Uh, pawn off of c6 and the queen has that move to get back and defend the pawn. So it's an example of a uh, miscalculation based on uh, on a position where uh, that move is not possible but you have to recognize that after after a few things have happened then that move becomes possible and that pawn is defended. Anyway this was, um, let's go through that again, he went c5, I took, rook takes, queen b2. This is still not bad for me but after queen takes a4 um, this is my, uh, well, this is a chance I have to uh, to uh, equalize. So this was really not a mistake at this point. I'm still doing okay, but I have to find the right move here. So if you want to uh, see if you can figure out what I should play here, um, this is a, a good good tactical or uh, positional <laughs> test for you. I don't know what, what to call it exactly. Um, Okay, pause the video if you want time to think about it. Yeah, what's how should white continue from this position? And, of course, you have the clue that rook a1 is not the right answer. Okay, I'm going to give the answer away now. Um, you start with rook takes c5. And the point of this exchange, which I really did not think about at all, but the point of that exchange is it's dragged the bishop away from... Uh, from uh, 
uh, from defense of the f6 square. So you then can play queen to f6. And here is the, finally the one moment in the game where I can exploit that uh, weakness that black created by pushing these pawns forward because this is a double attack. I'm hitting the rook and I'm hitting the pawn over here. And so that means I'm getting my pawn back. And uh, it's a uh, still, I think, uh, an even position, basically. Um, black has this outside passed pawn, which will be a strength in the end game. Uh, his king side, though, will be a little more torn up. My pawn structure is very neat, but I need to really uh, activate my pieces. And black still has the bishop pair. So all in all, it, it comes out to about even if I had played the uh, the correct move there. But anyway, I played rook a1. Uh, you know, I had noticed by this time that his queen could come back and defend the pawn, but I didn't see, having chosen to play this way, I didn't see any other alternative. Let's see. His queen went back to d7. Uh, let's see, I brought my rook over to the b-file. Um, I had, I had some ideas of maybe bringing the queen down here and rounding up that pawn that way. Um, he went with rook d to c8. So doubling on the c file. And um, I brought my queen in over here. I'm just trying to uh, activate as much as possible. And then he went d4. Now, um, black does have the advantage here. But uh, I could still stay in the game by taking that pawn. <laughs> And this is something I calculated, but didn't didn't calculate uh, well enough. Um, if I take the pawn, I thought he would trade and play this move, which is uh, a pin on this knight, I thought. But I, I, it's an example of just not looking ahead uh, deeply enough, because the knight could unpin immediately by taking the bishop here. So my rook is hanging, but his rook is hanging too. So there's there's no pin there at all. In fact, he has to, has to take the knight back, and then I can grab the pawn, and that comes out fine for me. So um, so definitely I could have just uh, grabbed on d4. And in fact, uh, after queen takes d4, the chess engine says um, queen to uh, c7 is black's best response, not trading and going for that pin, which leaves me in good shape. So uh, once again, uh, we're getting into a position where, where black is a little better, but this is pretty close to even. So that's what I should have played here. Um, instead, after d4, uh, you know, I saw that line where he exchanges and I get pinned and I didn't like it. <laughs> so I, I played the move queen to e4. And uh, this actually should lose. Let's see. Let's go ahead. He plays this correctly. Uh, I had missed this move. And I spent a little bit of time um, calculating queen takes d4 and, and uh, didn't think too much about uh, queen to e4 and the skewer. So I'm, I'm really in big trouble here. Um, I, I just wanted to say a little bit, uh, you know, my opponent has, has continued to fall behind on the clock, but um, this always has a, a negative effect on me when my opponent is in time trouble. I know you're supposed to uh, take advantage of your opponent's time trouble, but uh, uh, it, it makes me a little bit nervous and I don't calculate as well. So I actually um, blame this uh, queen e4 move, at least in part, on my opponent's time trouble because normally I would uh, spot a skewer like that pretty easily. Um, but um, anyway, uh, I, yeah, there's no there's no good way out. I try to uh, complicate things by playing rook to uh, rook to b7, and um, you know it's uh, we're on uh, move. 34 at this point, and my opponent is down to just a few minutes on his clock, so he's got to get all the way to move 40. So he's not able to uh, to fully calculate this out himself, but uh, but you guys uh, <laughs> watching this video have have the chance. So I have just played the move uh, Rick to b7. It's Black's turn. Can you find the uh, winning continuation for Black? How should Black continue to win this game? Okay, uh, pause the video um, if you want time to think about it. Um, it's a pretty good uh, attacking exercise for you attacking players. You should be able to find a good attacking line here. I'm going to give the answer away now. And um, uh, just remember, there may be more than one way to continue, but this is, uh, this is one way that, that, that looks to be winning. So just the check, starting with the check here, um, I trade takes back its check again 
have to block with the bishop. And uh, now uh, all this time uh, his queen is hanging and my queen is hanging, but that was all with check. Um, and now he plays queen to uh, c8 to get his queen out of trouble. And um, let's see, I, I, I can die very quickly here if, with a move like uh, queen takes e7. I mean, maybe this is the kind of thing you can calculate and see, oh, he's, he's uh, getting his piece back here. Actually, I'm a piece up at this point in exchange for a pawn, but uh, this is completely losing after rook takes f1 check and bishop to h3 check. Wherever the king goes, it gets mated <laughs> because queen to uh, queen to c1 is going to deliver the mate. So I cannot grab that bishop. So the fact that he has some material hanging at this point uh, is not really relevant. In fact, the, uh, the chess engine is recommending rook to b8 which uh, which loses after, uh, let's say, he takes the queen, I take the queen, and he takes the rook, and he's just a rook up here. So that is uh, just a winning continuation for black. And, um, and if he had a little more time on his clock, he might have been able to find it. But, um, well, like I said, he only had a few minutes on his clock, and he had to make it to move 40, so you couldn't spend them all on this one move. And the movie came up with was Rick, Rick to c7, just blocking the attack on the queen. But now this is uh, okay for me. This is one line I had calculated that was going to be all right because I can just uh, take the Rick off. He takes back. And now uh, I have a couple moves here. The move I saw and what I was planning to play was uh, Rick there, check. And then I was going to grab that pawn. Um, but also <laughs> I could just take here, even simpler. Uh, and both those actually leave black with a slight edge. But um, anyway, my opponent was a little bit disappointed at this turn of events. Uh, after after he played queen take c7, he was looking at the board and he said something, ah, it's just a, a draw, just kind of uh, an under his breath exclamation like that. And, you know, so I looked at the position and I, I thought about it and I just offered him a draw. I said, would you like a draw here? And, and he agreed to it. So we agreed to a draw. Um, technically, I shouldn't have offered the draw, right? I should play my move first and offer the draw. But anyway, it worked out okay, I think. Uh, um, we were both uh, pretty tired at that point. And uh, he was not looking forward to uh, making the, last, the next five moves in time pressure. And uh, yeah, I wasn't looking forward to uh, maybe blundering again in my opponent's time pressure. So I realized that I had uh, dodged a bullet there because when I, by the time I got to this position with the bishop there attacking my queen, I knew I was in trouble. So the final game uh, ended up as a draw. And as I was saying uh, at the beginning, uh, that means I broke even for the tournament. I actually um, looked up my rating. Um, so there were a couple of tournaments that I played before this one that got rated uh, in between, you know, they take the last published rating, which was 1803, and that's how I was playing this tournament. But after those those tournaments were rated, my rating had dropped down to 1766. And then when this tournament got rated, it went up to 1768. So so that's basically break even. I gained two points. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about my takeaways from this tournament. It was uh, definitely a little disappointing for me. Um, I had chances that I did not uh, take advantage of. There are a couple games that I, I could have won. But, uh, you know, my opponents also had winning chances against me. So that, that works both ways. And um, one thing I noticed, I guess there were two takeaways. One was that uh, I got into more trouble out of the openings than I'm used to. So I think uh, I need to do a little work on my uh, openings. If you think about it, games one and two were both... Uh, kind of opening disasters. That was the Moran variation that I misplayed and the uh, Neo Philidor where, uh, where I got into a position I wasn't very comfortable with. And then there was this opening, which uh, in this round six game where, where I really did not get anything out of the opening and, uh, and was worse uh, pretty much the whole game. Um, so I, I guess uh, the one, one takeaway is I really need to uh, shore up my opening repertoire and take a look at those, uh, those the holes in the opening repertoire and see if I can do what I can do to fix them. Um, and the second thing is that uh, there are several instances where I really just did not calculate deep enough. You know, and just uh, looking ahead one more move would have made a, a critical difference in several games. So, so the second takeaway is I really need to learn to uh, slow down in these uh, tournaments and uh, really uh, look 
at uh, all the possibilities. So, so those are my two takeaways from this tournament experience. Um, and in terms of uh, my actual performance, leaving leaving aside my lessons, it seems like I am still uh, stuck in that uh, boundary between uh, class A and class B, and that's, uh, I guess, a, a reasonable result uh, uh, considering. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this series, and I will see you again soon.